I'm going to be talking about um, the overhead throwing athlete and specific injuries we see in the elbow of the throwing head, uh, the overhead throwing athlete. I think this is a very complex topic. So I have a lot of slides and I'm going to move through them kind of quickly, but um, I'm hoping to kind of hit the important parts and, and hammer those home. So as anything else, understanding the anatomy and biomechanics is very important. We'll talk about some focused exam findings, imaging, and then it really hit the three hot topics in the overhead athlete being UCL injuries, uh, OCDs and younger athletes, and then dogs extension overload. Uh, if we have time, we'll get to some, some kind of trends we're seeing in prevention. So anatomy, we already went through. The UCL is the main medial stabilizer. Um, anterior bundle is your primary component we're concerned about, and that's where we focus in these injuries. This is a nice picture where the UCL is actually reflected backwards there. So the UCL is being reflected back here. The UCL is pointing in this direction here. So that's the UCL where that UCL attaches. Um, so history for an overhead athlete, you want to pick up things like their dominant hand, if they've had any trauma, what their athletic level of activity is, how much they pitch, how often if they pitch, um, when their pain occurs, what time it occurs in terms of when they throw. Does it hurt when they reach back or when they let the ball go? And then changes in their routine, their training, and, and then the pain with throwing. Th this diagram or picture here showing this guy's elbow shows you the experience and the force the elbow generates as you come through an overhead throwing mission or motion. It, it's not a natural motion for the human body, but it's something we've gotten good at doing real hard now as you, as you see throwers in the major leagues. So understanding the anatomy of your biomechanics of your throwing motion, the wind-up is where you generate your energy, you get your knee up, and you don't have much force on your shoulder or elbow. As you pass into your stride, you start seeing the, the whole body come forward, and you're starting to load that shoulder and elbow. So your elbow is going to extend and then flex back to generate external rotation, and it ends when your foot hits the ground. So your elbow is going to come all the way straight, and then you see it come up in that flex position. And this is where you start seeing pathology. When you start having your caulking phase of the, of the throwing motion, your late caulking or early acceleration phase, and this is where you're generating maximum external rotation forces and torque on the shoulder, which you can see pretty clearly as this arm goes past what would look like a normal external rotation profile. And then as the arm comes through, you accelerate the arm, move it past to launch the ball. Your, the velocity your elbow can generate and your shoulder can generate are incredible, uh, 2,300 degrees of rotation per second. And that's where the energy is delivered to the ball, that little, you know, 13 ounce or whatever baseball weighs now is being, you know, projected down the, down the, the line at 100 miles an hour. Um, and your elbow starts to flex a little bit. And then finally, deceleration. Your arm experiences a little internal rotation. The, the, the arm slows down rapidly, and, and mar much of that force is generated in your body and, and, and in your balance and staying upright. So UCL injuries are typically thought of as uh, things that happen, you know, to baseball players. They can certainly be traumatic. Um, I don't think this is going to work, but this is a wrestler that gets his arm bent back in the wrong direction. Typically, they're going to complain of pain at that medial aspect, that insertion of the UCL. They may or may not have heard a pop. Um, they may have had kind of mild symptoms before, and, and occasionally they're going to have you know, these ulnar nerve symptoms like Dr. Black was talking about. So how do you examine this overhead athlete? Well, it's important to understand that an athlete or an overhead laborer that does repetitive actions with one side they don't do on the other is going to have you know, abnormal anatomic considerations to think about and abnormal physical exam findings, and it's important to understand what's normal for that person. So start inspection, range of motion, get your fingers on them, touch, figure out where it hurts, uh, have them localize it, go through a stability exam, and then these special tests we'll talk about. So range of motion, you're looking for firm and soft endpoints. Really an extension, you should feel a bony endpoint as the electronon tip locks into the electronon fossa. In flexion, it should be more soft. You're kind of limited in flexion by your muscle mass and the things in the front. So if those endpoints are switched in terms of their feel, you've got to think about what could be causing that. And then understand that people that do throw for a living or throw you know, for a high-level activity are going to have some degree of elbow flexion contraction, about half that population. Um, touching the UCL, the UCL is covered by your flexor and pronator muscles, so it's important to flex the elbow as that moves that muscle mass anteriorly uncovers the UCL and lets you palpate both the medial epicondyle and the, uh, the sublime tubercle or that crest on the ulna. Um, but touching there may not be the most specific test, but it starts to guide you in the correct direction in terms of the rest of your, your exams and, and what you're thinking about doing. So stability of the elbow, stress testing of the elbow, understand that the elbow is not a stable joint like Dr. Callahan was talking about. It wants to dislocate, and the things that are holding it together are big, strong ligaments and these kind of passive, bony uh, landmarks. So 
when you examine someone's elbow, you have to unlock it. Um, the UCL provides that valgus stability, and that's most isolated in about 7 degrees of flexion. But it's difficult to examine someone's elbow because their shoulder gets in the way. So you have to place them in a stable position, and that can be prone, that can be supine, or you can do both to just kind of double check yourself. Um, the whole idea, no matter how you do it, is you want to abduct and, and, and externally rotate the shoulder to lock it in place, and then flex the elbow about 20 degrees and apply this valgus stress. And you're, you're trying to feel if there's gapping or if they have pain when you do that. So you can do it with them upright uh, if you get a good feel on this, and you can kind of use your offhand to push on the side of the elbow and generate force. You can do it with them laying down if that makes it easier for you. Or I actually do it prone because I think it's the easiest way to lock their shoulder in place and they don't tend to look at you and try and anticipate what you're going to do if you put their face down on the table. Um, and then another maneuver that helps is called a, a milking maneuver, which is essentially a, a form of valgus stress. You're basically abducting their arm to about 90 degrees and then externally rotating. And all you really do is grab a hold of their thumb and put the back of, their, back of your hand behind their elbow and use that as a stress point to break their elbow back behind you. And, and that will generate pain at that medial aspect as well, as well with, with UCL injuries. So anytime you're evaluating a patient with an elbow injury, we always start with a plain x-ray. It's the easiest way to see fractures, dislocations you know, heterotopic bone formation, any of the obvious things. But the next step usually is an MRI. And elbow MRIs have to be done with contrast. It's really that simple. Um, elite athletes, children, whatever you're doing, it's going to help you and increase your diagnostic criteria and your diagnostic ability. So, um, you know, this is what an elbow arthrogram looks like. This is your medial aspect of UCL. So you can see the medial epicondyl here. And this is the ligament running down here where it's torn off the sublime tubercle. So why don't we do contrast? Why do people show up in my office with an MRI without contrast? Well, the most common reason is in red. Whoever ordered the MRI didn't order it. And that can be primary care physician, that can be another orthopedic surgeon, that can be a variety of people. It's just not understanding that's available. Sometimes radiologists don't want to do it or it's not available or in their practice or they're scared to do it or they don't have fluoroscopy or think it costs more. The, the cost is negligible when you talk about having to repeat MRIs for people that didn't get it. So it's something you should really be thinking about. And these are just some good pictures showing how the UCL can tear. It can tear proximally off the, the epicondyle. You can tear it in the mid-substance, uh, right down the middle of the ligament. Or you can, the more common form is this, this tear off the, the distal aspect. And then there are these, these varieties, these partial UCL tears, where they talk about what's called a T sign. So the ligament isn't torn completely off, but you start to see this T-shaped fluid right here. And you can really see that diagram. It's a sideways T, but it, it's definitely a T. Um, and that helps you pick up those partial injuries that may be questionable on an MRI. So what do you do for a partial UCL tear? Well, there's certainly a minimal to non-operative treatment, and not everyone needs a UCL. If you're not going to throw something for a living or you don't have a grossly unstable elbow, you know, when the pain goes away, the problems go away. But if you have someone that needs to use that elbow at a high-functioning level, they need to have it fixed or they need to have it heal. So ways to get it to heal, rest, physical therapy, anti-inflammatories. There has been a lot of pub recently about PRP treatments and getting athletes back into play. Um, and, and I think some of this overestimates the capability of PRP. A lot of these partial tears can heal on their own with proper rest and physical therapy. And adding something certainly doesn't hurt, but thinking that PRP is a be-all, end-all to treat UCL tears is kind of dangerous territory. And I can just say in my, my limited experience in practice and fellowship, I have seen a lot of people come in that have failed PRP injections. So there's no way that these, these reports of getting, you know, 88% or, or one failure out of 34 athletes are, are really in line with what's actually going on out there, at least in, in my uh, experience. So uh, fixing the UCL, Tommy John surgery. Th this, is, this was first done in the 70s on this guy, Tommy John. That's where it bears his name from. He was a pitcher for the Dodgers in my hometown. And, and this guy, Frank Job, who did it out at UCLA, said, look, the chance of this working is 1 in 100, but the chance of him never pitching again if I don't do something is 100%, so let's give him a shot. So he did this surgery that he kind of created, peeled all the muscles off, recreated it using a tendon from his wrist, and it took him two years, but he did get back to throwing, and, and now he's famous for all the reasons that he shouldn't be. He's famous for being a surgical candidate rather than the fact that he won almost 270 games, I think. So this is him when he was pitching, and this is, I actually met him at a, T or a Little League dinner, and he's a interesting guy. You just got to be careful what you say around him because he kind of goes off the deep end with some of the things he says. Uh, so UCL reconstruction, there's a variety of ways of doing it. The, the basic idea is you're taking a tendon graft, whether that's a palmaris tendon or a hamstring tendon, and you're going to elevate off those flexor pronator muscles that cover the UCL when you examine it, and you're going to create tunnels in the bone and recreate the ligament using these, these grafts. There's a way, there's three or four different ways to do it. Um, not one of them has been shown to be significantly better. It's more of a technique thing. And this is just a quick video 
showing a UCL reconstruction, um, you know, the basic idea is you make a big incision similar to what you're doing for an ulnar nerve transposition, and that's actually typically the first step as you get down to the soft tissue. You can identify the small cutaneous nerve, this is what we're moving out of the way, that little strip coming across, and then you start getting up to the ulnar nerve, which you can see coming across right here. You free up the entire ulnar nerve. You can use a piece of um, essentially like tissue or, or, or string to, to hold it up so you can really free up all of its attachments and get it completely out of the way. And then the last thing you do is you bring this band of tissue down that you're going to use to transpose the nerve later. So all that's kind of set aside. Then we scrape the muscle off, identify the underlying ligament by clearing all that muscle completely off, and now you're starting to see the joint underneath. And then you split the diseased ligament in line. And it's not going to look 100% healthy, but as you get through it, you'll see there's diseased tissue underneath. And you'll just see the radio, or you'll see the uh, medial joint space poke through right here as you get through the ligament. Uh, then we drill tunnels to accommodate the bone. You're drilling a Y shaped tunnel at the distal aspect, so two holes that intersect each other. And we do that by sticking this curved clamp in there to allow us to aim the second drill tunnel. So you're kind of aiming for the tip of the spear. Um, and then you'll see passing a graft through this. So this is, a, this is a cadaver graft. Typically, we take something from the wrist or from the, from the hamstring tendons to use, but um, this is just a nice representation of how it goes through. And I'll kind of skip the rest of this because I think I'm going to run out of time if I keep going through it. But the basic idea is then you drill holes in the humerus and, and pass the graft and, and tighten it down whatever way you want to do it. So reconstruction results are excellent. It's a long recovery. Four and a half months till you start throwing, really a year till you're fully recovered, but they tend to do very, very well. The vast majority return to the level of play, and usually if they don't, it's because they were in the tail end of their career or they were a high school senior and don't want to play anymore. Um, the biggest care you got to take is, is not to, sorry, that was out of order. Um, the biggest care you have to take is to make sure that you're, you're properly reconstructing and not doing any damage while you're there. Now, a newer thing that's cropped up is these UCL repairs, the idea of taking the native tissue, leaving it in place if it's not a huge tear with a bony problem, and, and putting something to help back it up like a backstop. And this is the idea that Buddy Savoy came up with and, and was the original UCL paper. They tried to repair him and didn't work, but he said, what if I add something? So what he added was this, this collagen dip tape. So instead of taking out the diseased ligament, putting a new one, you repair the ligament underneath and then give it this backstop. And this backstop also has collagen impregnated in it, so it, it funds healing capability of that ligament to try and, and get it to heal into place. And then it has this check rein to keep it from tearing again. And, and these are, are newer surgery that are really excellent because the results tend to be much faster recoveries. Pitchers can get back to throwing in six months as opposed to a year, and, and so far they've been excellent results. The only caveat with this is the results have been all in young athletes, so if you're treating young, healthy people, they tend to do a lot better than the, you know, the 35-year-old who's been pitching for 25 years. So this is just kind of indicating that reduced rehab time, lower complication rates, and they do very well. So we'll switch gears real quick and get to one of the other topics, this valgus extension overload, which I think has a good correlation with UCL injuries. The basic idea is you have bony impingement of your elbow, usually at the back, a more medial aspect of it, and you, you overload that compartment and end up with an elbow that looks something like this, where you have these osteophytes or bone spurs forming back there. You get compression on the lateral side, which leads to over-tensioning the medial side, so that creates UCL injuries. Um, you lose your elbow's range of motion, and you end up with this problem where when you extend fully, you get this bony endpoint that's painful. So the way you test for it is just bouncing the elbow in extension. You bring them out fully straight and then kind of just bounce them and blot it over that, that elbow and it'll cause them pain as you bounce back and forth. So a really simple test to look for this problem. Um, and and that's, that kind of brings up this, this uh, treatment for it. Usually non-operative treatment works relatively well. Anti-inflammatory strengthen the muscles around the elbow. But if you have to take them back for surgery, it's not a terribly difficult procedure. Typically it can be done arthroscopically. You, the idea is you have this bump back here. When you get in with the scope and you're looking at the back, this is your lecheron. Um, and then this is that big piece of bone. You shave it out. Once it's clear, it typically doesn't come back. But you do need to treat them afterwards to make sure it doesn't. So they do very well with this. About 85% return to the level they were at playing. The, you can see their, their range of motion profile drastically increases. Obviously, you're taking out a bony check. So they should do quite well. And the only question is, what comes first? Is it UCL insufficiency or is it valgus extension overload? And, that's something we don't know, but they tend to run in, in sequence with each other. So if you have a patient you think has a UCL chair or valgus extension overload, you shouldn't miss the other. You should be looking for both and really have to rule out the second one if you find the first. Uh, so the last thing we'll talk about is osteochondritis descans or OCDs. 
um, in the elbow, especially in younger throwing athletes. This is your little leaguer with pain in their elbow. Commonly, this affects the capitellum somewhere in that almost closed growth plate range of 12 to 14, usually males just because they tend to throw overhead and females tend to be softball type throwers. Um, and then you can see it in gymnasts too. Basically, anything creates this repetitive micro trauma to the elbow that can lead to vascular insufficiency is kind of the root cause of it. So those are the typical athletes you see it in. Um, what you typically start with is an x-ray and you can see it, oftentimes they pop up on an x-ray just kind of looking like something fuzzy in the joint of this non-congruent surface of the capitellum right here. And really when you look at the radio capitellar joint, it should be very congruent on all the, all the views you're looking at on an x-ray. And then usually the next step is getting an MRI and you can see this is a nice contrast MRI and you, you see this problem with the bone sitting around that capitellar area. So here's another good example, 10 year old with elbow pain, very clear OCD lesion on his capitellum. You can see his growth plates are still open in his radial head here. And there's his, there's his lesion. And just looking at it through a couple more views, you know, seeing on a sagittal view, you can appreciate it here, radial head, growth plate, capitellum, and there's obviously a problem. And on an axial, the same picture. So what do you do with these? Well, non-operative treatment tends to work very well. Um, especially in open growth plates, which is what these, these kids tend to have. You, you take them out of pitching, they don't throw for three, four, five weeks, and slowly you progress them back to where they can be competitive again, and if they have no pain, say la vie, you know, let them, let them get back to it. If they have pain, then you gotta start thinking about how to fix it. So when we talk about fixing them, you're looking for loose pieces in the joint, if they fail their conservative management, or if they have an unstable lesion, meaning a lesion where the, the articular, uh, or the synovial fluid can get behind it and isn't gonna give it good healing potential, or Patients with a closed physis, they just don't seem like they're gonna be doing well with this. Open versus arthroscopic, both do very well. Um, I think the trend has been trying to fix these, you know, put a screw or something into them to put the piece back in place. And really what we've realized is you don't have to fix them. Taking them out, you know, like, like you're seeing here, so this is that, that OCD and then this is after it's been removed and this is the subchondral bone that's now exposed on the capitellum. And then doing something else to initiate a healing response and typically what that is is microfracture which we've talked about in other instances, but this is what it is. You have this bone exposed, you take this small pick, or now we're realizing it should actually be done with a small drill is better, and you make holes in the bone that will bleed, and that bleeding bone brings out marrow elements which will form fibrocartilage over that area, which isn't the same as articular cartilage, but for a non-weight-bearing joint like the elbow, it does very, very well. Other options, if it's a really big piece, is you can do these these osteochondral transfers where you're taking usually cadaver tissue in the elbow or you can take it from inside the knee and you're putting these plugs of bones, so you drill a hole and then fill it with these bone plugs that look like this to restore that, that articular cartilage. Um, the good thing is they all do very well, so kind of the red is the important things here. High rate of return to play, a lot of people just choose to play something else because they get worried about having young kids with elbow problems um, and, and usually they go back to the level they were at before their injury. So one last thing I just wanted to talk about that I think is very important for the, the primary care aspect or the athletic trainers or physical therapists, people that are out in the community, is understanding that this is a problem. You know, UCL injuries in kids are going through the roof. We're seeing six or eight times the, the amount of surgeries and injuries as we saw years ago, and a lot of these kids can't play anymore after they have these injuries. So um, what's the problem? What's causing this? Well, this is, this is just youth and and high school pitchers and the, the ACL surgery or UCL injury rates that are going through the roof. So what, what, what's the problem? Why are we doing hundreds of these where we used to only be doing a couple? Well, there's a couple risk factors. One is every parent thinks their kid's the next major league baseball player and puts them in five different teams and has them play year round because they think the more you pitch, the better you get. And that's not true. The more you pitch, the more you get injured. You know, kids have to be kids. They have to play sports, not sport. You need to do other things to condition your body and take the strain off the joints and the tissue as it grows and matures. If you're throwing all day long, you're just setting yourself up for an elbow problem. So kids that pitch a lot, triple the injury risk. Pretty simple. They should have four months off of the year where they are not playing baseball. They can go do something else, play with their friends, ice skate, you know, do something different other than play baseball. Um, other things, increased innings, increased shoulder injuries. If we decrease pitch counts, if we bring in pitch count rules, it has been shown very clearly to decrease injuries. So it's a no-brainer to have pitch counts in Little League. No one's gonna get a major league contract by being a good Little League pitcher. Um, this is just a nice retrospective study. 80 pitches a game, four times the risk of injury. Pitch eight months out of the year, five times. If you pitch tired, you're gonna get injured. It's that simple. If your shoulder's tired and you're trying to throw, guess where the force goes to and all the strain? goes right to your elbow and there's your problem. So, last thing I'll talk about, curveballs. Curveballs aren't dangerous, they used to be. We thought curveballs were the be all end all. When I pitched in Little League, I was told you can only throw two curveballs an inning or 10 curveballs a game. 
we've really figured out it's more force put on the elbow. If you're throwing a curveball at 70 miles an hour, it's much more forceful than a curveball at 50 miles an hour, but it's the same for a fastball or a changeup or something like that. So really, it's, it's the force you can generate as a child that's going to put your elbow at risk, not the type of pitch you're throwing. There's no increased torque on the UCL or the medial elbow when you throw breaking pitches. And then just some, some injury prevention things. Pitch counts are important. Rest after pitching is important. And then, and then uh, uh, pitchers can't go to catchers. So these are some resources I put in there, just the things you want to see. Um, these are websites you can go to, stop sport injuries, places you can learn about ways to prevent injuries and, and how kids should be managed. And just keep in mind when you're examining the elbow, take it easy, be calm, you'll find out what's going on.